When I heard this concept, I thought, this is fascinating. I really, really want to learn about this. And while the gentleman who can tell me all about it is here, it's called the Defiant Requiem Verdi at Teresin. And it will be performed February 23rd, this Saturday at IUP's Fisher Auditorium. His name is Murray Sidlin. He is the creator. He is the conductor. And good morning to you. Good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here in the studio. Now, you're not from these parts. Uh, so uh, how long have you been here in Indiana getting ready for this? Um, actually, I've been in Indiana now a little less than eight hours. Uh-huh. <laughs> but the, the, the uh, preparation has been going on uh, yeah. with the local uh, choirs and the conductors who are putting it together. Yeah, And then I come in. As, as the hero on the white horse, to be the recipients <laughs> of their great work. <laughs> and, and then I put it together as a, uh, as a performance. I'm here with my, my colleague, our production director, uh, Mark Rulis, and we, we do this uh, all, over, all over the world, really. And uh, we're getting close to our 50th performance. Really? Yeah. Wow. And I was reading some of the reviews of them. They say it is so touching, uh, and, and especially because... For folks who are not initiated into the the whole world from which this springs, yeah. um, it is an eye-opening experience for them. So let's explain what the Defiant Requiem is all about. Well, the the title is exactly what it is. It's the a, a, the Requiem, of course, is a uh, part of the Catholic liturgy, which has been set to music by many, many, many composers. So when you hear of a, a Requiem by uh, Verdi or a Requiem by Beethoven or a Requiem by Brahms, it's, they all all take the same text and set it to music. In the Terezin concentration camp, which was a, a Nazi camp from 19, late 1941 to 45, uh, there were musicians there, and they had a, a very strong musical society, over a thousand concerts in a concentration camp. Wow. And the ultimate was this performance of the Requiem Mass composed by Giuseppe Verdi. Now, a lot of things are wrong with what I just said. I mean, for example, I mean, everybody there is in prison for being Jewish. Mm -hmm. So what in the world are they doing steeping themselves in deeply into a work of the Catholic liturgy? Well, the work itself was so powerful and the text was so meaningful. Uh, what they did is this, they kind of retranslated a lot of the text from what it means to a Catholic to what it means to a prisoner. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, one of the things that uh, I carry this with me because I never want to forget exactly what the text is. In the Requiem Mass, there is this uh, line in Latin, quid quid latet operabit nil in nultum remenebit. Whatever is hidden shall be evident, and nothing shall remain unavenged. Now, that supposedly is your relationship with God, mm -hmm. except for them, this is their relationship with the Nazis. Nothing shall remain unavenged. So they lifted yeah. their fists with voices, and they sang with dignity and power and courage to indicate that they're going to get through this and that God's going to punish those people, those who, who chose to usurp God's authority for humanity. Now, this is in a concentration camp environment. The natural question is, how did they get away with it? Well, first of all, it's in Latin, so the Germans didn't speak Latin. So mm -hmm. they, they, and if they did, all they had to say, well, this is the text of the, of the Latin Mass. We're mm -hmm. just uh, you know, singing what is already there. But how they got away with actually singing it, you know, there, there were three commandants to that camp. The first two didn't want any performances, didn't want any recreation, didn't want um, anything other than uh, work, sleep, die. That's all they wanted. Just mm -hmm. that, was, that was the environment of the slave labor, mm -hmm. which is what it was. They, they, these people worked slave labor hours, 8, 10, 12 hours a day with hardly anything that was nutritious, hardly and no medical attention, and no protection from the elements. I mean, it was a concentration camp like any other, mm -hmm. except that for some reason, and it wasn't anything that was calculated, they just kind of blossomed into a tremendous environment for the arts and humanities. Not only were there a thousand concerts in this camp, that, but, but there were 2,400 lectures, 
all sorts wow. of activities. So the first two commandants didn't want any activity. But the third commandant said, look, if it'll take their minds off of the hunger, if it'll take their minds off of the illness and take their minds off of where's my husband, where are my children, and all of those horrible thoughts that went through their, you know, was part of the terror that they experienced. Mm -hmm. If it'll take their minds off of it, let them. Fine. Let's bring it up from being uh, hidden in the basement to uh, out in the open and let them go to concerts, let them go to theater and so forth. So that's how it happened. So this conductor, this fellow by the name of Raphael Schechter, who to me is a major hero, he's the one that after many, many performances got the idea, you know, let's, let's try something as the, the ultimate statement mm -hmm. of who we are and, and to, to defy the, the nature of our imprisonment, to defy terror, and to warm our hearts and extend our lives by being inspired by man's best when every hour on the hour we experience man's worst. So he recruited... Listen, I mean, this is incredible. He recruited a chorus of 150 people. Mm -hmm. So after their slave labor hours, we'd go down to this basement, and one night he'd have the women down there, and he'd pound out the parts on an old keyboard that they found. And then the next night he'd have the men down there, and he'd pound out the parts, and he'd put them together. And weeks and weeks later, they put together 16 performances of the Verdi Requiem. And, and inspires people even today. Inspired you, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. When I came across the story, uh, my first reaction was, don't give me that. That's impossible. <laughs> number one, why would they? And number two, how could they? Mm -hmm. And then my investigation, you know, I ran across all the right people, people who actually sang in that choir. Wow. I mean, it was a... It was a circuitous route where I, by which I found them. But when I did, they told me the story. They told me the story of, of, of rehearsing and performing. And after the first performance, by luck of the draw, about two-thirds of the choir was deported off, mm. to, the, off to the camps, the, the, the death camps. Mm -hmm. But with deportations come importations. So the conductor recruited and filled up his choir again. This time he had about a third of the choir left who already knew it. So the rehearsals went faster yeah. the second time. Yeah, wow. It's, it's just amazing. And I can't imagine you sitting there and actually talking to the people who performed in this uh, what it must have felt like for you. So yeah. on Saturday at IUP's Fisher Auditorium, yeah. what will people experience with the Defiant Requiem? Well, they will experience the complete performance of the Verdi Requiem, but told between the movements, between the sections, the story will be told about what happened to Terezin, why they chose the Requiem, how they had to put it together, and what this music meant to those who listened. So uh, we don't have orchestra. They didn't have an orchestra, but we have piano accompaniment with violin obbligato, and then we have uh, a com com combination of choirs putting together the entire Verdi Requiem with four soloists. There's some uh, along the way between the movements. As we tell the story with two actors, we also tell the stories with some video interviews of people who were in the original choir as well. So it's what we call a concert drama. As you were assembling this yeah. and, and really creating um, this from the vision that was given to you by these folks, um, what did that do to you personally in terms of uh, the way that you looked at what happened then and the way we look at the world even today? Well, I think in a few words, let's just say it changed my whole career. Uh, prior to coming across this story, I had two things in my life. I was conducting a lot in a lot of different places, and I was teaching conducting at uh, University of Minnesota. And I had just accepted a position at the Oregon Symphony as the second conductor there. And so but when I found this story... I became consumed, not just absorbed, but really consumed by, first of all, did it happen? Mm. Secondly, why? And the more I got into it, the more I was kind of, I, I felt the gates clang shut behind me as I was completely consumed by this. And, and actually now I devote practically all of my career 
to illuminating this story, to telling this story, so that people understand where Terezin was. It's not a very well-known place. Who was there? Why they did why they did what they did. That is to reach out for the arts and humanities as an injection of fuel and spirit and heart. And so uh, it really changed my entire career. So now that uh, we have the Defiant Requiem Foundation and I devote myself to uh, making sure that the legacy of Terrazin is known. A couple of moments left with Murray Sidlin. And again, the performance is going to be Saturday evening at Fisher Auditorium. When the performances are finished and you're having the chance to interact with people who have seen it. I would guess that there are some whose parents maybe um, have been involved in, in, certainly in the concentration camp environment. Maybe you've come across uh, some who were actually in Terrison. Um, what they say to you afterwards must be so meaningful. Well, you, you bring up a really great point. I have never lectured or given a performance of Defiant Requiem where there wasn't somebody in the audience whose lives were affected by what took place at Terezin. Parents, grandparents, great uncles, cousins, and so forth. And, and they, they do come up to me and say, you know, and actually on a couple of occasions, survivors, really? people who were there. Wow. Yes. Uh, there's one fellow who came up to me after the performance in uh, Lincoln Center in New York and said, I was only 10 years old, but I remember the visit from the Red Cross. I was there and so forth. He was actually a child in Terezin, and, and uh, he was in the audience. And I gave a lecture at a, at a school in New York City, and a man came over to me and he said, yeah, I was in the audience for three performances of the oh. Verdi Requiem at Terezin. Wow. And he had amazing things to say about his experience in hearing this music. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed to have met people who, who were there. They have the tragic vision. They know firsthand what terror is like and what, what man can descend to unless we are vigilant. Saturday evening is going to be uh, a life-changing experience for anybody who was there to see it. We're so grateful you came in today in this weather <laughs> to visit with us. Thank you. And we look forward to Saturday night. Uh, it just is going to be a, a fabulous evening at Fisher Auditorium at IUP. Thanks again for coming in to visit with us. We hope that um, many, many people come to the performance on Saturday night. It's, it's going to be special. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Murray Sidlin with us here this morning on The Voice of Indiana County, WCCS AM 1160 and 